In experiment 7b, we are going to learn an experimental technique to determine the percentage of a colored component in a particular mixture. From experiment 7a, a mixture of white potassium nitrate and blue copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate was produced. And we're going to want to determine in experiment 7b what's the percentage of the white potassium nitrate and what's the percentage of the blue copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate in these crystals. Now, what we're going to do experimentally is we're going to take the crystals, we're going to dissolve them in water. And whenever ionic compounds are dissolved in water, the positive and negative ions separate from each other. The white potassium nitrate will now exist in solution as separate potassium ions and separate nitrate ions. The blue copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate crystals will exist as separate copper 2 ions, separate sulfate ions, and separate water molecules. To that solution, we're going to add ammonia to that because when ammonia is added to any solution that contains copper two ions, it forms a polyatomic ion, Cu, NH3 taken four times, two plus, which is a deep blue color. That's going to be really significant. So if you can imagine, maybe we have five different students' samples of these crystals here. They'll have varying amounts of the blue copper two sulfate pentahydrate in them. If we take these five different student samples, dissolve them in water, and add ammonia, and if the solutions wind up looking like this, what does that tell us about the amount of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate that must have been in each of these students' samples? Well, the darker the blue color you see, that means you must have more of this deep blue CuNH3 taken four times two plus polyatomic ion. Why would that be? Because there was more copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate in those particular mixtures. So a more saturated color of blue means a higher concentration of the colored component, which is that polyatomic ion containing the copper and the ammonia. And so the saturation can be determined by measuring the amount of light absorbed by the solution, and we call this the absorbance. So in our experiment today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take solutions like this, and we're gonna measure how much light they absorb, because if a solution is really, really blue, it's gonna absorb a lot of light. So a lot of absorbance means a really saturated blue color, it means a lot of the colored component. If you have a very colorless solution, like I have on the very left up here, that has a low absorbance. It lets the light pass right through it. So low absorbance means there's a low amount of saturation, which means there's a low amount of the colored component in there. So our eye is a type of spectrometer, a device that can determine saturation. We can clearly see the solution on the very left must have had the most copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, on the right rather, has the most copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, whereas the solution on the left must have had the least amount of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate in the original sample. Now, our eyes are not really quantitative. We can't tell the very right sample is 8% copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate and the very left one is 1%. So we're going to use a quantitative device called a spectrometer. It measures exactly the amount of light that's absorbed by a particular sample. And here's how it actually works. It actually has a light bulb in it that emits white light, which is a combination of all the different wavelengths, red all the way down to violet. There is going to be a barrier with a slit in it that's going to allow a small beam of light to pass through, and then it's going to hit a prism. A prism, as you may know, separates white light or any light into its constituent colors. So if it's white light that's impinging upon the prism, it's going to separate into a rainbow of color. Then there's going to be another barrier with a slit. And if we move that barrier up or down, we can let either just red wavelengths or orange or yellow or green or blue or violet wavelengths pass through the slit. So in this case, we've uh, raised and lowered the barrier with the slit so that only the orange light wavelengths can pass through. Now, if we put our sample in its path, and we allow the light to hit the sample, and then some of the light will pass through because some gets absorbed, we will have a detector on the other end, and the detector will measure the amount of light that actually gets all the way through the sample. So if it knows how much light was put into the sample and it can measure how much light gets through, it can measure how much of the light was absorbed. <clears throat> so we're going to wind up choosing a specific wavelength of light. In this last example, we chose some orange wavelength of light. But we'll pick some specific wavelength, and then we're going to measure what the absorbance is of a whole bunch of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate solutions of known concentrations, and we're going to make a graph of the absorbances that are measured by the spectrometer and the concentrations. <clears throat> 
So as an example, these would be considered sample solutions. If I know my first container has 0% copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, and the last one is 0.100% copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, and the other ones are in between, I can take each of these samples one at a time, place them into the spectrometer, and measure what their absorbances are. The absorbances for the first sample, because it doesn't have any colored component, would, should be zero. And then as the solutions become darker and darker, that means they're absorbing more and more light. So look what the absorbances do. They go from 0.2 to 0.4 to 0.7 to 0.9. They're definitely increasing for that reason. Well, I want to make a graph of the concentrations versus absorbances and see how that graph turns out. And so if we make that graph and plot each of these data points, we're going to see that these points lie in a straight line. So there is a linear relationship between absorbance and concentration. And that is really important because now if we can make one of these lines, which is called a calibration line, then if we measure the absorbance of a sample and read over to the line and down to the uh, x-axis, we can know what the concentration of the copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate must be in that particular solution. So in the experiment today, there's going to be a series of standard solutions whose concentrations are known and their absorbances are going to be measured and a graph like this is going to be produced. And we're going to be using the program Logger Pro to make the graph for us. And when we do, the graph will look something like this which, with each of the data points given in red. And at the very top, there'll be a little box on the graph and it says A at 608.0 equals MX plus B. So the A at 608.0 means they're measuring the absorbance at a particular wavelength. They're just telling you in the name what wavelength they use. On Logger Pro, it actually has A dash 608.0. But then I, people start thinking, I think that means A minus 608. And I didn't want you to think that. So on my little demonstrations here on our PowerPoints, I'm going to use the at sign to try to emphasize to you that there's really not A minus 608, as you'll see on Logger Pro. It just means the absorbance at a wavelength of 608.0 nanometers. And then it says that absorbance equals MX plus B because the relationship is linear. The absorbance, as you can see, is plotted on the Y axis. So it's on the Y side of the equation, Y equals MX plus B. The X is wind up going to be the percentage of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate in the sample. And then uh, Logger Pro gives you the numerical values of the slope, M is 1.9 and the intercept 0 0.001. So this equation can be derived from the graph on Logger Pro, <clears throat> where we know the numerical value of the slope and the numerical value of the y-intercept. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if we look at the actual slope itself, the slope is not a dimensionless number. The 1.9 actually has units to it. And I want to show you how you determine the units of any slope from any graph you're ever given in a science class. Slope, of course, is the difference in y's over difference in x's. You just have to look at what are the units of the y-axis and what are the units of the x-axis. It turns out that absorbance is actually a ratio. It's the ratio of the intensity of light that goes into a sample divided by the intensity of light that comes out. And because intensity units would cancel out, absorbance has no units. But the, the uh, delta x value, which is our difference in x values, are going to be the units on our x axis in our graph, which is the percentage of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. So we're measuring the change in absorbance over the change in concentration, and the units of absorbance are no units. The units of concentration in this particular experiment is just going to be percentage, more specifically, percentage of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. So if you have no units divided by percentage, the actual units, if you simplify them, would be percentage to the negative 1. So if I want to write my equation for my line based upon this experimental data, I would say the absorbance at 608 nanometers is going to equal 1.9% to the negative 1 of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate multiplied by the concentration of the copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate plus the intercept of 0 0.001. Okay. Now, in today's experiment, you're going to wind up using the spectrometer. Let's talk about some of the techniques involving that. The first thing we need to do is set the spectrometer equal to zero. So what we do is we place a colorless solution, which is called the blank, into the spectrometer, and we set its absorbance to zero. Because if our solution contains no blue color at all, we want the spectrometer to read that as zero. And so that's what this does. <clears throat> 
Now, once we set it equal to zero, then what we're going to do is we're going to take a sample solution that's fairly deep in color, and we're going to place that in the spectrometer. So a deep colored solution would look like this. So we're going to place one of our standard solutions that are colored into the spectrometer. And then we're going to have the spectrometer shoot every wavelength of light through that sample. And we're going to make a graph called an absorbance spectrum. And it's going to wind up looking like this. This is the graph of the absorbance of a solution at all different wavelengths of visible light ranging from 400 to 700. And you're going to see that the absorbance is really, really low for most of the different colors except for, wow, right around orange. It seems that our sample really absorbs orange light well. Okay, Why would that be? Well, if a solution, what we're putting in the spectrometer is blue and our sample solutions today are blue, they always absorb most strongly their complementary color, which is orange. To know this, you would have had to probably do art masters back in elementary school or taken some art class somewhere along the line because you would need to know the color wheel. The color wheel is just putting the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet in a circle. And then when you do that, the colors that are opposite each other are called complementary colors. So if we have a sample that appears blue, that's because when you shoot all wavelengths of light into the sample, they allow the red to go through, the yellow to go through, the green to go through, the blue to go through, and the violet to go through, but they absorb the orange. So when the orange is taken out, the remaining wavelengths wind up appearing blue. So you could sort of predict what wavelength is going to be the one that absorbs most strongly or what color is going to absorb the most strongly if you know the color of your sample. If your sample is blue, then you know it's going to absorb uh, orange wavelengths really strongly. If your sample is red, look at the color wheel, you know it's going to be absorbing green light really strongly. So we would expect the peak in this graph to be somewhere in the low 500s where green is. Now, what's the significance of this graph? Well, we get the most accurate data for the relationship between absorbance and concentration if we use the wavelength that the solution absorbs the strongest. And that wavelength is called lambda max. Lambda, remember, being the symbol for wavelength. So this is the wavelength of maximum absorbance. So on your graph, that's located right here where the peak is. And if you just read down to the bottom, that's going to be the wavelength that you would want to use to measure concentrations in this particular solution because the data is going to be the most accurate. So in measuring the absorbance of solutions, it's always most accurate to measure the absorbance at the wavelength max. On Logger Pro, which is going to be the program uh, working your spectrometer today, it's going to actually look at the graph itself, determine what the wavelength max is, and actually tell you, would you like to use this wavelength? And you will say yes. And then in your data table, you're going to record whatever that wavelength is so that now we know what the wavelength is for this particular experiment so that if anybody else wants to repeat your work, they know what wavelength you actually used. Okay, so we're going to determine experimentally today in lab the absorbances of each of our standard solutions. We talked about this earlier in this lecture. So we're going to have different solutions of different amounts of the copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. The first one has no copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. The next standard solution, standard solutions mean you know their concentrations. The second one is 0.025% copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. And they increase and they increase where the last one, the fifth one there, is 0.100% copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. We'll take each of those samples, we'll put them into the spectrometer, we'll read the absorbances which are given in green here, and these numbers should make sense because as you have more and more of the colored solution, that means that the spectrometer will, have show, will show you more and more of the light is being absorbed. And then we're going to wind up getting a graph from Logger Pro, and it'll say at the top, absorbance at whatever wavelength that it happened to choose for you, and we're just saying it's 620 on this example. And that absorbance is a linear relationship with concentration, so that's going to equal mx plus b, where x is going to be what you're graphing on the x-axis. Look down there, what is that? Percentage of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. It'll tell you the slope. Here's a more realistic slope, 0.9612, and it'll tell you an intercept, 0 0.001. Okay? This relationship is called a calibration line. And the calibration line uh, is going to uh, be the relationship between absorbance and the concentration of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. One more bit of information that's given to you on the graph on Logger Pro is something called a correlation.
It's no number you're going to use in your calculation anywhere. But what Logger Pro does is it takes your different data points, in this case, my five red data points, and it does a little um, mathematical analysis of those points to see how close those points are to a straight line. If those five points are perfectly on a straight line, the correlation is one. If they're not very linear, then the correlation deviates from one and becomes lower and lower. For uh, experimental work in, in the hard sciences, like chemistry, uh, if we do calibration curves like this or calibration lines, we want that correlation to at least be 95% or 0.95. And in this case, the correlation is 0.994, which is like 99.4%. The points are perfectly linear, so that would be acceptable. So you'll be looking at your number from any time you do a, a, a spectrometer um, experiment where you're doing a calibration line like this. And as long as your correlation is above 0.95, you know you've done a pretty good job of making a calibration line, okay? So the uh, Logger Pro will tell you absorbance at 620 equals mx plus b, and then for you to wind up getting the calibration line, you just substitute in the value for m that it says and the value for b, and now you'll have an equation you can use. So the absorbance at 620 will equal our slope of 0.6, or rather 9612, and its slopes will be, its units will be percent to the minus one, multiplied by the concentration, because X is going to be the concentration of the copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, plus our B value of 0 0.001. Okay? <clears throat> so now that you have this equation, what can we do with that? Well, now you're going to take the sample of the potassium nitrate and the copper 2 sulfate that came from experiment 7A. We're going to dissolve in water, we're going to add ammonia, and we're going to actually add that, or then place that into the spectrometer and measure what its absorbance is. So let's say we take our sample of our crystals, dissolve them in water, add ammonia, it makes a blue solution, we stick it into the spectrometer, and the spectrometer shows that our sample has an absorbance of 0.246. From that now, and our calibration line that we just determined, we can now determine what the percentage of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate is in the crystals. So here's the calibration line. Here's the equation. We know the absorbance is 0.246. So I'm going to place 0.246 in place of Y. And I'm going to solve for C, which is the concentration. So you would subtract 0.001 from each side first. And when you do that, you get 0.245 divide by 0.9612, and you're going to get your value for C, which turns out to be 0.25%. This is the percent of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate in the sample, and if there's only two components in the sample, the rest must have been the potassium nitrate, so 100 minus that would be the percentage of potassium nitrate, which comes out 99.75%. So these are the results you're going to want to determine for today's experiment. Now, a little uh, theory behind this. In 1852, the chemist August Beer proposed a mathematical explanation for this linear relationship between the concentration of a colored component and then its absorbance. And Beer proposed that the absorbance, which we know equals some slope multiplied by the concentration of the colored component plus B, can be expressed because the slope of this line is the product of two particular constants. One is called epsilon, that's the Greek letter epsilon, and the other is L. This relationship, absorbance equals epsilon L times C, is what's known as Beer's Law. If you notice something's missing here, there is no intercept. That's because theoretically, this intercept should always be zero. How come we had an intercept of 0 0.001 when we did our example just a few moments ago? because of experimental error. But your intercepts will always be really, really close to zero. They should theoretically be zero. Now, what do these variables stand for in Beer's Law? A, we've actually used already. That's the absorbance of the sample that has a colored component in it. But what is this epsilon? It's actually called an extinction coefficient. And it's just a constant for the particular colored component. So if we have a red component that we're going to measure its absorbance, it'll have a specific extinction coefficient. If we have a blue colored component, it'll have a different extinction coefficient, and a green one would have a different extinction coefficient as well. And then for any particular colored species, in our re experiment today, we are doing a blue component, 
if you use different wavelengths, the extinction coefficient will vary. So therefore, this is a constant for a given colored solute at each given wavelength. So if we did the experiment today with our blue solution at a wavelength of 620 nanometers, then it'll have a specific extinction coefficient for that wavelength. But if somebody else did the experiment at 619 nanometers as their wavelength, the extinction coefficient will be different, okay? So the reason we actually use the maximum wavelength in a spectrometry experiment like this is that the bigger the uh, absorbance is at a particular wavelength, the larger the value of epsilon is gonna be. And that means you're gonna have a wider difference when you measure different concentrations, you're gonna get bigger differences in absorbances. That means the data is gonna be more accurate. The L in the part of the slope there is actually the width of the container that holds your sample, which we call a cuvette. So we're putting our colored solutions in actually not a rounded bottom container, but it's actually a rectangular solid square type container. And there's gonna be a certain width associated with that. And that's how much solution the photons of light have to pass through. And the more solution there is, the more chance they have of absorbing uh, by a colored component. So this is gonna actually determine what the absorbance is. For our cuvettes that we use at our school, it's 1.00 centimeters. So that L value will always be 1.00. And then the C is your concentration. And it can be in a variety of different units, this particular experiment. The concentration unit we were using is percentage of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. So if this theoretically is true, then what you could do is you could actually calculate the extinction coefficient for any different chemical at any different particular wavelength. And I would like you to be able to do that and your post lab questions will ask you to do something like that. So let me show you how a calculation like that would be done. Let's see if we can calculate the extinction coefficient for absorbance at a wavelength of 620 nanometers using a 1.00 millimeter mil, uh, centimeter cuvette, uh, given the calibration line that we had earlier today, absorbance at 620 equals 0.9612 Celsius degrees, or not Celsius degrees, but percent to the minus one multiplied by concentration plus 0 0.001. Now, to calculate the extinction coefficient, you do not need to use this equation. Let me say that again. If you want the extinction coefficient, don't use this entire equation. Think back to Beer's law. What did Beer's law say the extinction coefficient was related to? It's related to the slope of the line only. I only need to look at the slope in this calibration line and everything else I can ignore. So because the slope, which is 0.9612 equals epsilon times L, all I have to do is plug in my slope value and plug in my L value and I can solve for epsilon, which is the extinction coefficient. Solving for the extinction coefficient is just gonna be the slope of the line, which we have given above, divided by the L value, which they told us in the problem. I'm just gonna divide those two numbers. 0.9612 percent to the minus one divided by 1.00 centimeters will give me my value for my uh, extinction coefficient. And in this case, because the slope is only two significant figures, my answer will be two significant figures. So I'm gonna round it to 0.96 and the units will be percent to the minus one and then centimeters to the minus one. And that's how extinction coefficients are calculated.